Live from the Orion Cygnus arm of the Milky Way galaxy, this is Scientifically Speaking, a weekly half-hour program devoted to elegant curiosities, and I am one of your hosts, Sarah Chang, and joining me, as always, is Bernie Rhyme, DJ Star Watcher. How are you, Bernie? Yes, hi, Sarah. Very good. Thank you. Bernie is our professor of the Astronomy Lab at USM and our local protector of the night skies. Reach out to us at WMPG, scientifically speaking, at gmail.com or on Twitter at WMPG SciSpeak. And if you miss this show or your other favorite shows, you can find the last five weeks of archives on WMPG.org. Bernie, could you let our listeners know what is up in the night sky for this coming week? Yes, certainly. Thanks. Okay, so this will be Friday, February 12th. So we're just past new moon. That means there'll be not, and the moon will not be in the sky at all. So you can see all kinds of other interesting things with no interference from that. So the only evening planet left will be Mars. It's heading up into the area of the Pleiades and the Hyades. So those are two star clusters in Taurus. So it'll be another week before it gets there, but you can see Mars and all the other planets we used to see in the evening, they all have switched to the morning sky. So your challenge for this week will be to see how early you can pick those up. They might show up as early as Valentine's Day, and they'll be a little bit easier to see it toward the end of the week. Of course, that would be Jupiter, Saturn, and then Mercury is going to join them also as Mercury joined them in the night sky before they left us a few weeks ago. So some interesting things coming up for this week, if you like getting up early. And then we're also losing Venus pretty soon in the morning sky. So pretty much all the actions in the morning now, starting in a few days. I feel so lonely. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Mars is lonely. <laughs> Thank you, Bernie. Yeah, you're welcome. And if you couldn't take notes quite fast enough, you can also check out the monthly What's Up column in the Portland Press Herald, written by yours truly. <laughs> so today's show is um, I, I didn't actually didn't um, I didn't get time to think of a fun name for it, but uh, essentially it's coastal Maine geology, and uh, we have with us a really special guest. We've got Dr. Mark Swanson on our show today. Welcome to the show, Professor. I'm glad to be here. So Dr. Swanson, he is a professor at USM since 1983, I saw. And um, in the in the redesigned Department of Geography and Anthropology, because it used to be the Department of Geosciences, right? Yes. And Dr. Swanson has dedicated the last 30 plus years to geologic field research, primarily in the structural history of crustal def deformation of coastal Maine. And uh, we learned about Dr. Swanson on this show when we had Dr. Bampton on our show in pre-COVID times to talk about his work on um, the destruction of Brew, which was a small community on the Shetland Islands. And uh, he aptly used the term that Dr. Swanson is the foremost expert of the rock formation and geologic history preserved in the rocks found on coastal Maine. So we're super excited to have you on our show today. Great. Glad to be here. <laughs> so um, we always love to learn how our guests got to where they are now. And your academic pathway suggests that you are hyper focused on geology from the beginning, at least from uh, from your bachelor's degree. Um, so curious, how did you find yourself admiring and finding value in these stories told by the diversity of the rocky floor beneath us? When I was an undergraduate, I had a, a, a professor who was very influential and he was a Maine resident. Um, his parents ran a uh, summer camp, some lake up up uh, in central Maine. So he introduced me to Maine. Uh, I was his field assistant for a couple of field seasons. And so I had a nice personal introduction to uh, uh, geology of Maine. And it really stuck with me from from that 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 moment to, to now. Did you um, what what got you to want to study pursue geology in undergraduate? Like, what did you was there something in childhood that was particularly appealing? Well, this uh, professor had uh, he had asked me what I like to do at the time, you know, other than school. And I was into backpacking in the White Mountains at the time because I was going to school at Northeastern University and uh, he said, well, that's great. You know, somebody could pay you to do that. And <laughs> I said, okay, 
And so he paid me to do that with him for a couple of summers and just kind of stuck with me. Yeah. Where, um, when, you know, you talking about um, your professor taking you to, you know, you're, you were his field assistant in Maine. That was actually my second question was what brought you to Maine. But um, where, where all did, did, he, did you guys go? Was there any? Uh, we worked area? in the uh, uh, Machias area in the blueberry. Okay in the blueberry barrens and uh, places where there isn't really a lot of rock. So we spent most of the time trying to find rock. <laughs> Instead, you found blueberries, yeah, little tiny lots. blueberries, right? <laughs> and so you came to Maine after, well, so you, you did your undergraduate in geology and then decided that you wanted two more degrees in geology. Yeah. Um, so after that, you came to Maine to, right. to, to come to USM, essentially. How did you decide that the coast was where you wanted to go? Because I assume you probably did field work all over Maine. But was that your primary focus was coastal Maine? Um, I learned uh, <clears throat> very early on that it is the rocky coast of Maine. So that's where the rocks are. And uh, there's bugs everywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> you know, mosquitoes and black flies during the field season, they were, they were uh, you know, infamous. So uh, if you got to be able to work on the coast, you didn't have to deal with any bugs. <laughs> That's a very, uh, a very great reason. <laughs> because it initially started with you being paid to go hike in the White Mountains. <laughs> right. And then you decided, no. Of course, we, um, you know, I mentioned that we learned about you from Professor Bampton and the two of you, along with many students, I, I, I presume, collaborated to explore more of Maine's coast and remote islands. I guess the goal there was to map some of the exposed geologic features. Had you used kind of digital survey tools and GIS before those experiences? Uh, you know, a couple of years before. Um, that was really the basis for the, the project was the digital skills that we could uh, have the students learn while they're making detailed maps. Yeah. And what was the impetus for that particular collaboration? Uh, I think it was that the kayaking was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, duly noted on your uh, profile was that that was a, an adventure. <laughs> it really was. Every summer, uh, we got to explore a different section of uh, Mid Coast and Casco Bay area. Yeah. Really hugely fun. And this was a National Science Foundation funded yes. grant. Yeah. Did you write that? That <laughs> the, the goal was... of this project is to kayak. <laughs> <laughs> no, not quite. But... <laughs> so the primary reason why the topic of Maine's coastal geology, why it came up in this post-show conversation that we had with Professor Bampton is because like many things, for me anyways, close observation of the natural world around us was not something that I personally did much of growing up. I think the closest I got to kind of the appreciation of geology was um, Stone Mountain. And so that's a park in Georgia that centers this domal rock called Stone Mountain. And I believe it is part of the Appalachian Mountain Range. Um, yeah. But, you know, it really wasn't until Maine did I start to become curious with what I saw just on the coast. And I think like many people, the craggy cliffs and the, you know, the rocky shoreline um, is just very beautiful. So Maine has a very accessible and dynamic coastline and um, too light uh, for those of you who live or have been to the Southern Maine region has, in my opinion, particularly interesting rock structures. And I think, um, well, this was the first thing that I noticed, but um, I think one of the first thing that people might notice is that the coast is stacked with these gray elongated shaped rock along the coast from to Light State Park, which is on the kind of southwestern end, to Dyer Point, which is where the, the two lighthouses are. And um, you've done extensive work surveying and kind of understanding the fault zones of this area. Um, 
what brought about that field work uh, culminated into what I think is probably one of the most detailed field guides I've ever seen. Um, although that means very little coming from a non-geologist. And so um, reading through information on the geology of Two Lights State Park from the Maine Geological Survey, the look of these rocks has been described as petrified wood. I don't know if, Bernie, have you been to that area? You said you, you went there for class, right? We did a project out there. We did some mapping out there, yeah. Yeah, and so uh, I never described it as petrified wood, but I thought that was a great description. And so for folks who did not spend a career researching and studying geology, is there anything particularly special about this type of grain structure that we see there? Um, my my immediate reaction is that it's almost slate or shale like yet you know obviously very different from granite well the it, it is renowned the rocks at two lights are renowned for their woody texture uh, particularly along the pathway where they they bring up uh, uh, blocks to line the walkways and they look like logs laying there on the on, you know on the ground next to <laughs> Uh, you know, they're like six feet long, or two feet in diameter, and, and it looks pretty, pretty impressive. But they're not, it's not petrified wood. But the rocks have been stretched to make them look like that. So the rocks have, uh, as a lot of the rocks, particularly around the Casco Bay area, they have this stretching lineation. So the rocks have been stretched, and when they break apart, they break apart into little spindles that are all parallel to each other. Huh. When, when you mean by um, when you mean that they're stretched, um, I, what does that mean in terms of like historically? They're they're obviously not. I don't think that they're stretching right now, right? No, no. <laughs> but remember, the rocks that you see there on the coast are uh, 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 wrinkles due to the continent continent collision, where all the sedimentary rocks that were in the uh, intervening ocean got pinched between the colliding continents. And they just kind of wrinkled up like a rut, like a bunch of uh, uh, throw rugs, and uh, and then <clears throat> uh, that pushed up the mountains in the process. But you can't push the mountains up too far; they weigh a lot, and so eventually they reach their limit. And but as you keep squeezing those rocks together, they can't go up anymore, so they ooze out sideways, and the whole mountain range becomes stretched and lineated parallel to that direction. Yeah, that's, um, so that's, I think the other thing that we might notice when we go there is that the rocks all seem to be perfectly aligned in this um, horizontal or vertical fashion, which, whichever um, direction you're looking at it from one end to the other. Um, and so clearly that's not coincidence, but um, the, the theory that I heard was that you, one could find these same rocks on the coast of Morocco. Is that false sure. or true? No, that's true, that's true. Because the, the rocks here, the mountains that we have here were formed by the continent continent collision, the other side of which was driven by Africa, the bulge in Western Africa. And so Africa was right here against North America with the mountains between them. So after all of that collision and deformation, then the continents relaxed and they broke apart and Africa pulled back away from North America to create the Atlantic Ocean. So yeah, you can find bits and pieces of the same kinds of rocks on both sides of the continent. That's crazy. Oh, on the ocean, both sides of the ocean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you been there to find no. any? No, no. <laughs> I was gonna ask, where could we go to find their twins? Um, Ireland is a good place. Oh, really? Ireland. Okay. That has a lot of similar rocks. So it, it doesn't necessarily have to be, well, I guess, um, when, when, uh, when you're talking about this con continent, continent, um, collision and then relaxation, uh, what time period are we talking about? I feel like the only 400 million years old for the collision and 200 million years old for the breaking of the continents. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and you probably can help me answer this. I kind of guessed that this was around the time of Pangaea, but... Yes, I'm... Pangaea was the collision. 
assembling all the continental fragments with a huge supercontinental landmass and building the Appalachian Mountains in the process as a result of those collisions. Wow. So there's two, so that's two phases that we have. Collision, smashing, building the mountains, and then kind of relaxing and then breaking apart to create the big Atlantic Ocean that we have today. And then each of those phases can be marked by a specific kind of rock material that you can see every time you go out. And for the breakup of the continents, building of the Atlantic Ocean, those cracks that formed filled with magma from below, like Hawaiian type magma. And that funneled out as lava flows on the surface 200 million years ago, as the continents broke and pulled apart. And we see those today as thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dike intrusions that are cutting through the rocks of the coast. These look like bands of dark rock. They could be a foot wide, could be you know, 10 feet wide, but they run continuously along, along the outcrops. Hundreds yeah. of them every time, every you look. If you go and Google, you can't help but see them everywhere. <laughs> um, well, so that, that brings me to, I don't think I had noticed dark rock until um, this is, uh, this is leaving our geographic region, but until I had gone up to um, Scudic Point up near Acadia, that's right. where I started to see more uh, diversity, I guess, in the in the rock intrusions there. Similar, similar up there, they have uh, dark dike intrusions, very similar to the ones that we have down here. So um, I think one of the third, and in my opinion, um, more interesting things that an observer might notice that too light is uh, very similar to what you're talking about is um, they, they're kind of sometimes these very dramatic sections of, uh, I crudely referred to them as lines of white rock that would run through not only one whole structure of rock, but through, um, you know, multiple sometimes. And then these later I learned are quartz veins, which is a much more sophisticated way of describing them. Um, and the explain it like I'm five explanation that I was given is that uh, it is essentially molten rock that finds its way up from the core of the earth into the cracks um, of the rock surface above and cools really fast and crystallizes into quartz. Um, <laughs> is, that's it's essentially the same thing as what you were describing in some ways, right? Except it's not right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the right explanation? So the other rock type I said I was referring to, this is one that's related to the collision, are these white stripes of of uh, quartz mm -hmm. and uh, and they are filling cracks just like the magma does for the dark dike intrusions, but it's not magma, it's not melted rock. It's hot water, like coming up through geysers at the surface. Mm -hmm. And as this hot salty water uh, flushes through the channel ways made by the cracks and as it rises, it cools and then precipitates against the walls and then seals up the cracks. So it's a crack fill by hot water. Hmm. We, hot would call water. Them, we would call them veins. Yeah. They yeah. do in the mining industry because quartz veins is where you find the, you know, the mother load of gold deposits out in the Sierras, for instance. Yeah. I, um, you know, I, I tried not that hard, but I tried to find, <laughs> I don't know if there was some kind of time lapse. No, there was, there were no, be no time lapse, but some kind of animation of this actually happening so I could understand it on YouTube. But all I could find were was people looking, searching for gold in quartz. And I was like, what? I'm not looking for this. <laughs> um, well, so... one, thing that, one thing that happens to the rocks is they, they're getting, a, I, I refer to it as a bulldozing collision, as these two continental bulldozers come together and they just pile these rocks up on top of each other and it gets a thick mountainous pile. The minerals in the bottom of the pile start to warm up, and mm. some of those minerals contain water in their chemical formula. So as they heat up in the lower crust, they start to dehydrate, and it just drives this flood of hot water from the root of the mountain range, flushing up through, uh, through all the deformed rocks, finding any way it can to, to get a pathway to the surface, like cracks. Yeah. So it fills a crack. 
and the white quartz forms inside the crack, then you'll see it as a little strip of white running across the rock. Yeah. If you're lucky you're on the beach, you can find a, a, a pebble that has a ring of white all around it, a circle of white around it, which is really just a planar crack fill that you've sampled and then round it at the beach and you just, the piece of the quartz vein cuts right through the middle of the pebble. Is that like, uh, would that be a cross-section view? Sure, yeah. Oh, interesting. Um, actually, uh, when you when you mentioned that, I, I think I saw somebody's project um, where they had formed the entire alphabet of rocks with the quartz veins that made up the letters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so they had A through Z of all these yeah. little different pebbles, which I thought was really interesting. Um, so I guess I'm curious, when that quartz material, you know, before it becomes quartz, comes up through the cracks, then, because when you look at it, it's in line with the rock itself. Like, you know, right. it comes through the crack, and wouldn't it like, overflow like liquid? Well, remember what what you're seeing. If you're down there standing on the rock, looking at it, you have to realize that you're probably, you know, six, eight, ten kilometers in the interior of the crust when those oh. things were forming. So you got to be like a little adventure and be right down there, you know, it's completely buried in, in the rock environment. And then you can see that, oh, the rocks are doing all sorts of things down there. Hmm. Like stretching. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if they stretch in a, a little too fast, they could crack and they crack across the grain. And that's where the quartz veins come in. That, that's Literally. what I was just going to ask. How do they crack in the first place? <laughs> right, because they're being stretched. Remember the stretching story. Yeah, yeah. And it's not all it's not all uh, warm and soft down there. Sometimes it can get a little cooler and start to get stiff. And then the stretching mechanism switches to a, a fracture as opposed to a, a plastic mechanism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when I was reading your your field guide, I was. It was bringing back all these memories of my fracture mechanics um, that I didn't necessarily want to remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, so another um, uh, another thing that Professor Bampton had excitedly presented to me about the quartz was that he described the sausage-like quartz, and he uh, he called it boudinage, and he was yes. very this is very colorful about his explanation of it, but um, what's special about that? How does that how does that differ from the lines? Well, the uh, this process of stretching and cracking, uh, circulating hot fluids, precipitating quartz along the walls until the crack gets smaller and smaller, and then it seals itself up, and then more pressure can build and make another crack, and that will seal itself up, and so you get this pattern of all sorts of cracks forming repeatedly as these rocks are being deformed. <clears throat> and one of the aspects of the deformation is related to this large statewide structure called the Norumbega shear zone, mm. a San Andreas type fault that was operating 300 million years ago. And it, those quartz veins that are gr uh, crossing the, the lineation at Two Light State Park, once they're in place, then this shearing action takes place, we call it right lateral, where you look across to the other side and everything's shearing off to the right, flowing to the right. So these quartz veins are caught into the, they're, they're introduced into this flow and the shear causes them to rotate. Mm -hmm. Clockwise. Interesting. As they shear in a right lateral fashion. And as they rotate, all right, they're also stretching as they have to become longer as they as they twist in, in to the shear flow. And that's what stretches them even more. And they pot up into a series of pods, they'll pot up into a series of little, little pockets and little uh, sausage shaped features. Um, this was a structure that was uh, first pioneered by the French. And they, so they called it uh, boudinage, which is sausage. Hmm. And they look like a string of white sausages running through the outcrop one after another. Yeah, yeah. No, ever since I heard about it, 
I have been trying to find them when I, you know, walk around. I still have not found any. Found <laughs> so I'll, um, although when I checked out the geologic survey of two lights, I saw that they had a picture. So I just need yeah. to search a little harder. <laughs> I don't Where? often go by the state park area, but I have to check that out. So um, it's a rather, it's a rather uh, um, amazing uh, structural scenario of this deformation where you have stretching, fracturing, and placement of the quartz veins, then shearing and rotating and stretching into boudins, and then stretching and cracking and placement of more quartz veins, which cross the old ones, and they both are, are, are shearing and stretching into you know, several generations of boudins in the same outcrop. So it's just repeating back and forth, stretching, cracking, shearing, stretching, cracking, shearing. That's crazy. How, um, I guess from, from your standpoint, as somebody who is observing this, you know, on the surface, how do you even know that that happened? Uh, cause it leaves, it leaves back, it leaves behind, uh, traces of, of what has happened. Structures are forming in the rock that reflect the ap application of force on the rock in different ways. So like you could, you, let's say you didn't know anything about it, but you knew all the geology that you knew and you just came across this boudinage structure and you saw it in the ground you could look at it and sure. you would be able to figure out what had happened there sure it takes a <clears throat> this whole idea of uh, stretching cracking shearing and having that repeat time and time again over printing a whole complex of, of uh, structures that took a while that was you know my whole career trying to figure that out <laughs> You couldn't just tell that. No wonder you can't find them, Sarah. You can't read all that. That's, um, no, I, I think, um, you know, we, in my younger days, I did a lot of photography. And, I mean, that's just one surface. So it baffles me that you could, you could see so much dynamics. Um, I mean, I assume it takes more than... I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure it takes much more than than what what I what it appears to be. How long did it take you to? Um, and I'll. Sh is it okay if I share it with our um, with our listeners the field map that you shared oh, with? Oh sure, me? you want. Yeah. How long? How how long did it take you to create that? Uh, probably a couple couple years. Couple of years. Um, and and so in doing that. Is there something about two light besides some of the formations that we've talked about that amazes you or that you just find to be really interesting from a geologic per perspective? Well, I mean, besides that whole story with the quartz veins that I <laughs> just, just outlined, there's also a set of uh, right lateral brittle faults that cut through. Uh, three of them in the whole stretch from two lights down to dire point. And each one has a, a unique internal structure that we rarely get to see because faults as they, you know, get older and accumulate more displacement, they accumulate more damage within their core zone until finally you can't see anything about what they were to start with. Mm -hmm. So these are small faults. They only have maybe, uh, five meters at most of offset, like 15 feet, something like that. Um, and you can still see the internal structure of the faults before they, before they uh, really got organized and could accommodate quite a bit of deformation. Yeah. Oh. So it's a really unique view. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, would you say that for a blossoming geologist, that that would be kind of a good place in general to see a lot of really unique features or is there a better place? No, that's probably the best. That's really? The best. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, um, I, I was lucky <laughs> to notice some of these things. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Swanson, for coming on to our show um, sure. and for sharing um, your experience over in um, the two light area. And keep an eye out for those white quartz veins wherever you I go. Will. Yes, I absolutely will. You've been listening to Scientifically Speaking here on WMPG with myself, Bernie, and Professor Swanson. Stay tuned for our Sports Jam with Colin and Connor. And from your favorite nerds, mask up and we wish you healthy bodies and clean air. 
Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know a lot of those details, even doing some of the mapping work with you out there. That was yeah. I learned a lot just right now. Well, yeah. everything's changed, you know. I I started using drones. <laughs> the drones, yeah. So it changes everything about the mapping. I, you know, I, I wish I had these 30 years ago, but I have them now. Did right. you, um, so when you did the mapping before, is it just walking around and mapping with pen and paper? Well, just that's like pretty that? much what you do all the time, but it's, you need some sort of a base in order to tell where you, where you, where to put your lines of what you're trying to draw. So, um, I think I started with, uh, uh, enlargement of an old aerial photograph. Mm. So it was like having a really blurry image of the outcrop and where you could just barely make out some fractures and tide pools. And then you could use those as, as, uh, guides to where to put all your lines. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, I figured, um, uh, I don't know if, I guess we didn't really have Google earth until no, no. fairly recently. Yeah, so now you can go down to Google Earth, but unfortunately, you know, if, you, if you're familiar with Google, you zoom in to the maximum and you still can't see what's on the ground. Yeah, that's it's still true. blurry. So what the drone does is I can I can put that into focus as if you were standing on the outcrop. Yeah. And you can walk all over without leaving your house. <laughs> <laughs> um, how often do you um, do field geology stuff now? Just uh, well, on I, your own time. I was doing it every day uh, up till uh, Wednesday, Wednesday. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah. So I was flying drones and making maps right up until the snow cover. What's um? What's your latest project? Um, uh, these outcrops uh, at Parsons Beach in Kennebunk. Okay. There's a big house at the end of it. The big house, they call it. Yeah. Um, and they have a big outcrop at the end, so. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's a neat place. I, I used to go there all the time. I used to live in Kennebunk, right near there. Yeah, it's a pretty nice beach. I'd never known about it before. I just found it this year. Oh, yeah. Yeah, great beach. And you have Laudum Farm. You have the preserve right below that, that little river right. that comes out. That beach right. part is now private. There's big lawsuits going on by who owns the beach and all, but you know. Yeah. Carson's Beach. I've never, I've never even heard of it. Yeah, you should go out there. I may have driven by it, but I've never. No, probably not. It's real private. There's only oh, five. Really? Okay. There's only five parking places. Oh, yeah. Huh. Interesting. So do you, you just find new places and decide, oh, I want to map this place? Um, mostly I've mapped everything already. <laughs> so I'm taking, I'm doing the drone photos to retrofit the maps too. Ah, hmm. wow. That's, um, hmm. it's, uh, I feel like it's a lot of, it seems like it's a lot of fun because, um, yeah, I mean, with with that information, though, you know, I I was even just reading about how glaciers move, and I think I knew that they moved, but then I watched this time lapse of it moving. Um, there was this one glacier that moves like two hundred meters, and I would read about, you know, oh, this used to be glacial, some whatever, and it didn't mean anything to me. I'm like, there's no glaciers here. What are they talking about? <laughs> um, and it wasn't, in, you know, given that context. 